Hello and welcome to our second session on biblical prophecy. Let us pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to spend time in your word. And especially, O oh Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the truthfulness and reliability of your word. And so as we study today, may we gain a greater a new appreciation for your greatness and for your commitment of love to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we began our walk in this five-session class on a biblical prophecy last week, and we took a look at some principles with regard to biblical prophecy. Just as a matter of definition of what we talked about last week, a prophet is one who delivers a message for God. And when you look at it in terms of the wide sense of the meaning of that word, it is really anyone that delivers that message of God. The basic task to preach law and gospel, to call to repentance, to offer forgiveness. We also took a look at the narrow sense or the narrow understanding of the word prophet. And that is one who predicts the future. And it's the narrow sense that we're going to spend our weeks together focusing on. We looked at principles such as prophecy deals with matters that are small and they deal with matters that are great. They can cover short or they can cover long periods of time. They can be conditional, or they can be unconditional. Some prophecies we see in Holy Scripture were delivered by dreams or visions, and other prophecies we saw was with a direct encounter with God Almighty. We studied how some prophecies were given in plain, literal language and other prophecies were given in symbolic forms. We also studied of, of why it's important to study prophecy and the things that we highlighted last time we were together was that prophecy shows the glory of God. It shows his reliability. It shows the truthfulness of his word. We study prophecy secondly because it directs us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We study prophecy because it prepares us for things that are still coming. We study prophecy because it influences our conduct today. We study prophecy because it makes up really a great portion of God's word. And lastly, we talked about how we study prophecy because it's so important for us to be equipped to be able to defend God's truth so that when we hear strange interpretations of prophecy, we are equipped to be able to refute those errors. Well, today I'd like to examine with you prophecies that were fulfilled before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you look at the prophecies in, in Scripture, and Scripture, and, and they number around 767, 395 of those prophecies were fulfilled before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's really a significant number, isn't it? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a, a 30, 40,000 foot flyover of history in the Old Testament, breaking it into some periods in which we can look at some prophecy that was fulfilled before the birth of Jesus. So let's start in the period of the patriarchs, the period of the patriarchs. And to do that, let's look at Genesis, the 12th chapter, very first book of Holy Scripture. Genesis chapter 12, and we'll pick up in verse 1. There we read these words. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go 
from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Jump down then, please, into verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. The most important figure in the Old Testament is Abraham. Abraham. We know him first as Abram. And then we know him as Abraham. The most important figure in the Old Testament. For example, in Luke, the first chapter, Mary, mother of our Lord, references Abraham. In Luke chapter 1, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, references Abraham. God established a, a covenant. He established a, a contract with Abraham. And the components of that covenant were land, offspring, and that all the nations of the world would be blessed. In other words, God's redemptive plan to save the world would come through the descendants of Abraham, the chief one, of course, Jesus Christ. Notice, that when God established the covenant with Abraham, that was not based upon the worthiness of Abraham. No, God doesn't establish covenant based upon, well, there is someone here who's truly worthy of me having a covenant established with them. No. It wasn't based upon the worthiness of Abraham. It was based, based upon the faithfulness of the one who made the covenant. And that is God Almighty. So land, offspring, and blessing. That blessing we see in that the whole world is blessed because of the Messiah. Incredible prophecy. Going all the way back to Genesis, the 12th chapter. Prophecy of old, prophecy fulfilled. Well, well, that's just one example of a prophecy from the period of the patriarchs. The next period, as we look at the history of the Old Testament, was the period of the judges, the period of the judges. That goes from the death of Joshua and in 1405 B.C. to the coronation of the first king, and the first king was Saul. That was 1050 B.C. So in those intervening centuries, you have what's called the period of the judges. During that time, there were tribal leaders of the people. And when we talk about judges, we're not talking about people in courtrooms in black robes that are listening to cases and rendering verdicts. No, the judges that we talk about in Scripture were military leaders military leaders. It's interesting, when you look at the book of Judges, there's a, there's a cycle that is repeated over and over again in the book of Judges. What you have is you have the people of God doing evil in the sight of the Lord, God raising up enemies then of Israel as a form of chastisement. You have the repentance on the part of the people, and then God raising up these judges, these military leaders, to defeat the enemy. Now, another way to, to understand the cycle of judges is you can just use four R's as a, as a memory device. You've got relapse, retribution, repentance, and rescue. Relapse, retribution, repentance, and rescue. And you just see that cycle over and over and over 
again. There's not much prophecy recorded in Holy Scripture during this period of the judges. Because there's not much, that doesn't mean that there wasn't any, because we see prophecy and prophecy fulfilled. I think of the prophecy about the victories of Gideon or the victory of Deborah and Barak or the birth of Samson. But really in that period, you don't have much recorded prophecy in Holy Scripture. The period of judges then gives rise to the period of the kings. So you've got the patriarchs, you've got the judges, and then come the period of the kings. Important prophecies are given during this period. Uh, among them, you've got the prophecy that the Savior is going to come from David's family. You've got prophecy with regard to the division of Israel into two kingdoms. You've got prophecy about various dynasty and kings of the northern kingdom. Prophecy of the delivery of Jerusalem from the king of Assyria. So important, important prophecies are given during this period. In the latter part of the era of, of the kings, the era, E-R-A, of the kings... And after the return of the people from Babylonian captivity, so, so during that period of time, you have 16 of what are called literary prophets. Literary prophets. You've got four. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The, those four are called the major prophets not because they're more important than the other 12 literary prophets, but just they're called major because the books are longer. So you've got the four major prophets, and then you have what are called the 12 minor prophets. And those go from Hosea through Malachi in the, in the Bible. The literary prophets, the literary prophets contain about two hundred of the pages in Holy Scripture. So this is a significant portion of God's Word. And many of these prophets, they foretold about the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel by Assyria in 722 B.C. And they also foretold, many of them, about the destruction of of Jerusalem and the temple and the Babylonian captivity in 586 BC. So let's, let's step back and get a running start with regard to that piece of history. The kingdom had become divided. You had the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. Israel consisted of 10 tribes in the north then you had the south that consisted of the tribe of Judah. And also then you had the tribe of Levi. They were the, they were the priests. And they stayed with Jerusalem to fulfill the responsibilities in association with the temple. So let's look at a prophecy. Let's go to Micah chapter 1. Micah chapter 1. Now a good way to find Micah is to just go to the last book of the Old Testament, which is Malachi, and keep turning pages toward uh, the left. You're going to run into Nahum, and then you're going to you're going to run into Micah. If you've hit Jonah, you've gone too far. So we'll look at Micah, <clears throat> chapter one, and we'll pick up in verse one. Here is a, is a prophecy of both the destruction of Israel and Judah because of idolatry. So we'll pick up in verse uh, 1 of chapter 1 of Micah. 
And just a, a little reference here, when Samaria is referenced, that's the capital of the northern kingdom. So remember, you've got the divided kingdom, north and south. And so the capital of the northern kingdom is Samaria. And what this prophecy is in Micah 1 is the destruction here of the north and, uh, and, the, uh, and the south. So chapter, chapter 1 will pick up in verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morsheth in the days of kings Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear you peoples, all of you, listen, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For lo, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. Then the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will burst open like wax near the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. And this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire, and all her idols I will lay waste. For as the wages of a prostitute, she gathered them, and as the wages of a prostitute, they shall again be used. For this I will lament and wail. I will go barefoot and naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches. For her, her wound is incurable. It has come to Judah. It has reached to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. The destruction then of both Israel and Judah foretold. And the reason? Because of their disobedience. Because of their idolatry. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 25. Good way to find Jeremiah is just go to the book of Psalms. You've got Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, and then Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 25. We'll pick up in verse 11. And here you have what's called the captivity of Judah being foretold. So Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says the Lord, making the land an ever lasting waste. So you have in Micah 1, you have the prophecy about the destruction of both the north and the south. Here in Jeremiah chapter 25, you have prophecy with regard to the south. Let's continue to explore this. The prophet Isaiah, one of the major prophets, one of the four major prophets. The prophet Isaiah began his ministry in 740 B.C. He foresaw the demise of Judah. Now remember, the demise of Judah happened in 586 B.C. 
So he begins his ministry in 740 B.C. Note the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 39. So you're in Jeremiah. Just turn backwards and you bump right into Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 39. And we'll pick up in verse 1. Isaiah 39, verse 1. At that time, King Merodach Boladan, son of Boladan of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and had recovered. So that helps us to understand the, the period of time in which this is being written. Because when you look back historically at this king, this king here reigned from 721 to 710 BC. 721 to 710 BC. Let's jump down into verse 6. Days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your ancestors have stored up until this day shall be carried away to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. So there's a prophecy here then of the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction here of the south, and a deportation into what is called Babylonian captivity. Isaiah also predicted the res restoration. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 2. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's a prophecy then of the people being restored out of Babylonian captivity and back to their homeland. Isaiah also prophesied about the rise of a king by the name of Cyrus. Cyrus the Persian. Cyrus the Persian conquered the Babylonians in 539 B.C. So now, just to, just to wrap our heads around this, Isaiah is prophesying here Remember, he began his ministry in 740. He references those kings in the king 721 to 710. He is talking about matters that are going to occur in a restoration of the people that occurs in 536 as the people are released from captivity to go back to their homeland. So he's predicting about this king who's going to be, obviously, Cyrus hadn't been born yet. And here's another thing. When Isaiah is making this prophecy, the kingdom of Persia didn't even exist historically. So God has given him this word of prophecy about the restoration of the people, and he's prophesying and he's referencing a king that had yet to been, be born and the kingdom of the king that had yet to come even into existence historically when the prophecy was given. Look, please, with me at chapter 44, verse 24. Chapter 44, verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who by myself spread out the earth, who frustrates the omens of liars and make fools of diviners, who turn back the wise and make their knowledge 
foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the prediction of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah, they shall be rebuilt, and I will raise up their ruins, who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall carry out all my purpose, and who says of Jerusalem, it shall be rebuilt, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. Again, this amazing prophecy of that which would come about long after the time in which the prophecy was being made. Take a look with me, please, at chapter 45 of Isaiah, verse 13. I have aroused Cyrus in righteousness, and I will make all his paths straight. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Amazing, amazing prophecy that God gives to Isaiah. And then, just as Isaiah prophesied, the history unfolds. What we see also with regard to the prophets is they warned of God's judgment against other nations besides Israel. For example, Obadiah writes about the judgment of Edom or Nahum foretells the fall of, of Nineveh. And some of these prophecies are about, about world history of that which will be. Let's go to the book of Daniel, please. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. Daniel, and we'll pick up in chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, we'll pick up in verse 36. What we see also is prophecy about world history in Scripture. So, picking up verse 36, chapter 2 of, of Daniel. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, into whose hand he has given human beings, wherever they live, the wild animals of the field and the birds of the air, and whom he's established as ruler over them. You are the head of gold. After you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the whole earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Just as iron crushes and smashes everything, it shall crush and shatter all these. So the prophecy that's being given here is an outline of world history. Well, what does this mean? Or what, what is being referred to here? First, the gold part that's being referred to of this idol is Babylon. Babylon. And that was roughly uh, about the start of Daniel's ministry. Then he references the, the silver part. That's the Medes and the Persians, the next kingdom. That, that came under uh, King Cyrus. They came to power at that time. Remember, that was about 539 uh, B.C., and God used Cyrus to free the people to return to their home. The third kingdom referenced here, or the kingdom of bronze, that's, that's the kingdom of, of Greece. So we just follow, follow history, and you can just go right back into Scripture, because here's the outline of, of history. 
Alexander the Great killed the last Persian ruler in 330 BC. So you can see Daniel is, is foretelling here centuries uh, before this. So, so right now, we are over two centuries beyond the earthly lifetime of, of Daniel. And then he references in verse 40, the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom, the iron one, is the Roman Empire. They captured Jerusalem in 63 BC. Here you have in these short verses here, in Daniel, the second chapter, you've got an historical outline of four kingdoms that will, will come. You go over also, for example, into Daniel 11. And that covers a period of, of history that, that is centuries in the future. Centuries in the future that the Lord gives to his prophet. Prophecies then, already fulfilled in the Old Testament, prior to the Old Testament, We've just done a sampling here today from the period of the patriarchs to the period of the judges to the period of the kings. We've seen the literary prophets, all 16 of them. And the prophecies, their fulfillment assured the people that God's prophecy about the Messiah to come would indeed come true. Prophecy is such a rich subject to study, isn't it? And as you study prophecy, what you see once again is the reliability of God's word, the reliability of his word. Well, Next week, I look forward to exploring with you prophecy already fulfilled by Christ. We'll continue next week. God bless.